Now today I'm going to give you a, just a very brief overview of forensic entomology and give you the examples of how insects can be used in a legal investigation, both in the civil side and criminal side of um, uh, courtroom procedures and law enforcement investigations. Um, how it's up to you to incorporate this into your crime scene protocol, uh, where there really are no standard operating procedures, it's up to you and your individual agency of how you are going to incorporate these collection methods. Um, the one thing that should be relatively standardized is the fact that this collection should be done at the scene. Um, you should not wait till the body gets back to the medical examiner's office to do these types of um, entomological collections, simply because many of the insects that you're interested in uh, may not remain with the body. As they age, they will tend to leave the body and distribute themselves out into the environment. So it's important to do the scene protocols um, as they are described in your workbook. I start out most of my lectures with trying to define forensic entomology for everyone so they understand what forensic entomology uh, actually means. Uh, and in order to define forensic entomology, um, it's necessary to define the word forensic. Uh, forensic really has nothing to do with law enforcement or criminal apprehension. Uh, it deals with debate. Uh, it's the art of logical argument or the art of debate itself. Uh, the reason that it works for us in a legal setting and why you have forensic scientists in crime labs simply because for our adversarial court system um, the forum of debate is the courtroom. And if you practice forensic science, any science you debate in the courtroom um, becomes forensics. If we debate entomology in a courtroom, we are practicing forensic entomology. So it can be a criminal, and it can be civil. Um, it's not just insects that get on uh, homicide victims in the result of a legal homicide investigation. Uh, entomology uh, is the study of insects. Uh, an insect can be defined as any organism with six total legs, or three pair, a pair of compound eyes, a pair of antenna, and three body segments. So you can think of your typical ant. Uh, that is an insect. Um, spiders, which have eight legs and two body segments, are not insects. Uh, and we as entomologists specialize in insects. So if you try to come up with a, the most formalized definition we can for forensic entomology, it, a loose definition is the study of insects and their arthropod relatives that interact with legal matters. And we do have to put in the arthropod relatives bit because we often have non-insect arthropods submitted to us. We may be able to make some inferences to those organisms. Uh, many times what we will do is we'll find another expert and then we will ask that expert if they could um, assist us. So we as entomologists often will act as an intermediary uh, between law enforcement and the specific specialist, such as an arachnologist if you happen to have spiders. And we are interested in civil and criminal cases. Spiders we have um, submitted to us relatively frequently. Spiders may create a bite mark. Um, that bite mark may be characteristic, so we can usually determine spider bites from other insect bites. We may or may not be able to make some inferences as to the species of spider that made the bite, but it puts people in particular habitats and often bite marks can be used to create um, suspect and victim and scene linkages or associations. Uh, most importantly, it's what spiders do that could be important in your crime scene. Uh, it's not just the bite, it may be the web that they build. Uh, we have used a spider who built his web across an office cubicle to determine uh, a rough time frame of when that person was last uh, at work. Um, spiders who make their webs over doors and windows. A window may be ajar at a crime scene, a door may be ajar. Uh, try to photograph that spider's web extensively. Collect the spider. Try to collect the web. You can often collect webbing just by putting it onto uh, a cardstock or paper, uh, much like lifting a fingerprint. And uh, an entomologist could work with an arachnologist to come up with some time frames. So they might can give you minimum times that a window has been dislodged or a door open. So keep those in mind, or particularly spiders who may have built their webs across pathways that a suspect or victim would have had to cross through in order to get to the scene or to get to some particular item. 
Ticks, um, mosquitoes, blood feeding arthropods, you should always keep those in mind. They may have a very slow metabolism. They often will uh, take a blood meal. They may preserve that blood meal for a period of time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months. And in many situations, you'll get a better DNA yield uh, from the gut of the insect than you would, say, blood that is exposed to the external environment. Uh, blood that's in the external environment is exposed to rain, humidity, sunlight, um, it degrades. Uh, blood that's inside the gut of an insect, um, and that insect is digesting that blood very slowly, uh, can actually be preserved. It's protected from the external environment. So keep those in mind. Humans have been around in, in their upright bipedal form for approximately seven million years, give or take um, a few hundred thousand, depending on what um, anthropologist you speak with. Um, and insects have been around for about 350 million years, give or take 50 million years or so, depending on what entomologist you speak with. So insects have been around for a long time. Uh, they were here before dinosaurs. They saw the rise and fall of the dinosaur. They were here before flowering plants. Uh, they have adapted perfectly to their environment, um, and they need um, environmental stimulus in order to survive. So they respond to the environment very well. Uh, particularly our forensically important insects, many of them have a life cycle of a month or less. So if you have to uh, regenerate yourself and lay eggs and develop offspring, you have to go through that life cycle once a month and you've been doing it for 350 million years, you become very good at what you do. So these insects uh, very readily seek out decomposing remains in the environment and um, utilize those remains to ensure the survival of their offspring for the next generation. Some of the most primitive insects that you may see out and about today would be a dragonfly, for instance. Um, they're smaller now. Uh, and roaches. Roaches have also downsized a little bit, but um, they look very much the same. And it is true that you can remove the head of a roach and it will continue to live for some time. Um, it will eventually die because um, that's where its mouth is. It needs to take in food. But if you've evolved to the point where you can live for a significant period of time without your head, um, you're doing okay. You're going to be around for a long time. Many people think that um, forensic entomology is new. Um, it is not. It's been around for quite a while. I bring this slide up because it, it illustrates one point. You know, it illustrates the point that entomologists did not create forensic entomology as we know it today. Uh, it was created by attorneys. Uh, and in fact, one of the first published accounts of modern forensic entomology was from the 1800s. It's out of France, and it's out of a legal journal. And it was written by an attorney who realized that if he utilized entomological evidence in his cases, the jurors generally responded favorable to it. So they accepted the entomological evidence, they trusted it, they trusted the entomologist, and it was very successful. So he then published a series of cases um, in the late 1800s, from 1883 to 1898. And those articles got other attorneys aware of entomology. Um, they requested the assistance from entomologists, and it was through repeated requests of attorneys that entomologists actually really became involved in forensic entomology. The first published case of the use of an insect in a death investigation was from 13th century China in a book that's loosely translated to mean the washing away of wrongs. It was written by a Chinese death investigator, and he utilized insect behavior to help him identify a murder weapon. So it's been around since 13th century China. It's been used off and on, but um, it's recently seen a resurgent in European and American legal systems. There are three commonly recognized areas of forensic entomology. You know, the first is urban forensic entomology. It's generally civil in nature. Uh, rarely is there a criminal element to it. Um, generally, um, it would affect us while we're still alive, and it affects us in our pocketbook. Um, for instance, termite damage to structures. Uh, the structure is damaged, is deemed uninhabitable, and who's going to pay for that damage? Uh, we often will have to make a determination whether the required soil barrier treatment is done, uh, if it's been done correctly or incorrectly, if it was done, and were the building materials contaminated before they were brought to the site. So we have to make some determination as to who's financially responsible um, for paying for the home or structure. The other thing that we will get into is stored product entomology, uh, insects in our food items. 
Um, we, we all have consumed insects in our food. Um, in the United States, the average um, American will consume about a pound and a half to two pounds of insects every year. And the reason that we do that is because it's economically infeasible to grow food um, free of insects. So the FDA and the USDA regulate the amount of um, insect particulate matter that is allowed to be in our food. Uh, consuming insects generally is not harmful. There are only a few insects that are considered um, to be detrimental if you were to eat them. So because it's generally not harmful, there are a few health effects to it. Um, the amount of insect particulate matter in our food is generally an aesthetic problem. So if the food can hide the insect particulates, the default action levels, the amount of insects in the food is allowed to be very high. And if it's difficult for the food to conceal these insect fragments, then the default action levels remain relatively low. So it depends on the types of food that you eat the most uh, as to the types of insects that you consume the most. So cereals and grains often contain um, adult beetles and grasshopper parts. So it's the chitinous exoskeleton. And fruits and veggies have a lot of fly eggs and maggots. So you can kind of control the amount of insects in your diet just based on what you eat. Now occasionally we'll have a case like this. This is um, a Nestle's chocolate turtle. It's been infested with the larva of an Indian mule moth. Um, obviously that insect is not supposed to be there and obviously that insect is not processed. It's whole and it's still alive and there's more than one. So the question is um, how do these insects get into this food item and who could potentially be responsible for the pain and suffering uh, and emotional distress that uh, this individual uh, found themselves under as a result of recovering these insects in their food. This actually is a stock rotation problem. For most food companies, the rotation of the item after it reaches the retailer um, is a, a duty of the retailer. Um, and it's their responsibility to rotate the stock out appropriately. So they buy the product, put it on their shelves, hope it sells, if it does not sell, then um, they may get credit from the manufacturer or they may not, just depends on how the company is set up. So you have the responsibility to go back to the point of sale and try to find out where the contamination actually originated, which is what we did in this case. Um, we went returned to the store, we bought things that insects like to consume. We bought um, cereals, grain products, and we bought chocolates and peanut butter. And most of the cereal products that we bought had shown at least one generation of this insect in it. Um, one box had three generations. And at the temperatures, it would take about a month to go through one life cycle. So we could document about three months of infestation on the shelf um, in this one particular retailer. Um, another product I had bought uh, the year I was in the store had actually expired two years prior to uh, the year I was actually in the store. So we could easily demonstrate a stock rotation uh, stock rotation issue. So uh, is this allowable? No, it is not allowable. It violates um, some food handling protocols and someone may be responsible for this individual's uh, mental anguish, but it's certainly not the company that produced it. It's the responsibility of the store who held the product and um, eventually tried to sell the product. Another thing that's relatively common would be insects and alcoholic beverages. And not because the bottling plants are infested with, it, with insects, but because an open um, alcoholic beverage is an extreme attractant to bees and wasps. Um, if you have an open can of beer in the outdoor environment, it's going to attract um, feeding bees and wasps. And we'll commonly have consumer complaints of being stung in the mouth or on the lips um, while drinking a uh, alcoholic product. And it's not because they've been bottled into the can or bottle of a uh, beverage. It is because the consumer didn't notice the adult insect go into the can or bottle and they brought it up to their mouth and, and were stung. Uh, these insects will not live inside of a closed bottle or um, can of um, beer or wine. In addition to insects, other things that we find relatively common would, would include a slug. Uh, slugs are fairly common in consumer complaints simply because many people will consume an alcoholic beverage in an outdoor environment. Uh, they may sit the bottle or can down on the ground near grass or potted plants and then that becomes a slug trap. In fact, if you buy a commercial slug trap, um, they will have some commercial slug bait, but they also um, say pretty clearly on the label that you can simply bait the trap with um, beer. So the fermentation smell of beer is an extreme attractant to um, slugs. 
So we have some consumer complaints, as in this one where the individual was uh, consuming their beverage. They felt the uh, slug in their mouth. Um, they regurgitated the slug and uh, thought that it may be a part of them. They took themselves to the hospital. Um, uh, a ER doctor was not able to identify what it was, but he could conclude that it was not human. Uh, so the plaintiff uh, eventually contacted an attorney. Uh, this slug traveled the country for a while, ended up back with us, and um, it's not the only case that we've had. We usually get uh, several of these a year. So what we're here today to talk about and what this workshop is going to focus on is the medico-criminal aspect of forensic entomology. It's the use of insects in criminal investigations. And in, the most common thing that we do is use the insects that infest human remains after death to determine how long um, that individual has been dead. And the reason that forensic entomology works is because in most instance, instances, the same species does not re, uh, will not recolonize the body. If it was a constant recolonization where you had multiple generations for most species going through the human remains, um, we wouldn't know where in that circular process we are. So generally the body um, is decomposing. The adult insects respond to the tissues in particular stages of decomposition, so particular responses at particular times. They deposit their eggs, their eggs hatch, the larvae develop, and when those larvae reach um, maturity, they will wander away from the remains, complete their life cycle somewhere else, and when the adults hatch out of the um, pupil cases, um, those adults will go on and seek remains elsewhere. They don't come back to the set of remains um, from which they developed as a larva because during their developmental process that body has aged significantly and has changed and it's not a usable, re uh, usable resource for them. So what can we do as entomologists to assist law enforcement? Uh, it's commonly said that entomologists determine the post-mortem interval and that is not exactly true. Um, entomologists can determine a minimum portion of the post-mortem interval. Um, and the reason we say a minimum portion is simply because we can age the insects that are on the body. We can tell you how old they are. We know about when those adults arrive, so we can add the larval age to our expected adult arrival rate, and we can come up with a time frame. And we generally, we know that the body has been dead prior to the colonization, um, but we don't know how long it took that adult to arrive. The body could have been concealed for a period of time. There could have been some inclement weather. Maybe the adult arrived in just a couple minutes. Uh, maybe the adult arrived in four hours. Um, we're not sure how long it takes that adult fly to show up. And it's impossible to account for all of the environmental conditions that could affect that adult arrival rate. But we know generally when they show up, and we do know generally the age of the larva. So we're good at getting a minimum time frame. Um, the, and we call it a period of insect activity. So the period of insect activity may closely mirror the entire time since death, or, or it may not. So we try to stick with minimum post-mortem interval estimations or time of colonization. That's the guarantee of the minimum time that the individual has been deceased. We can help with cause and manner of death determinations. Um, many pathologists that we have in this country operating as coroners or medical examiners um, are not board certified forensic pathologists. They may not even be forensic pathologists. Um, most pathologists in this country do the, the uh, work of a medical examiner or coroner part time and many of them are surgical pathologists in a hospital. So we can assist them with cause and manner of death determinations because we can show them what should be the normal pattern of human decomposition. We can show them what types of environmental stimulus the insects will react to, and we can predict where these insects will show up. It's a predictable pattern, and anything that is different from that predictable pattern uh, usually indicates some sort of trauma or unusual circumstance. So you can gauge the uh, insect on the body, where they are on the body, when they arrived, and make some estimations as to cause and manner of death determinations. Determination of death location is another thing that we as entomologists can do. Um, you do not have to move a body very far um, from one location to another before you may change the insects on it. Um, simply moving a body in a, a backyard, if you move it from sun to shade, may alter the insects on it particularly if you move a body from an indoor or an outdoor location, that will do it. So if you've got a body inside that's eventually moved outside, um, we can usually tell that that one started in an indoor environment. 
And it kind of ties into the placement of the body after death with concealment of the body, storing a body in a trunk, um, in an interior closet, wrapping the body with plastics, or even freezing the body prior to um, placing it um, at a secondary crime scene. All of those activities are going to alter the insect pattern that we would expect to see on a body and alter the insect succession. So in many cases, entomologists can give law enforcement a pretty good idea of the type and nature of post-mortem treatment of the body before it's actually placed out at the scene. Criminal misuse of insects. Um, people will use insects as a form of abuse or punishment or the threat of a stinging insect. It's happened um, a couple times that I've been involved with. Um, a spouse would know that, the, uh, that their um, better half is uh, deathly allergic to a bee sting, so they happen to place um, bees or wasps in that environment with their spouse. Uh, another one would be um, locking a child in a small interior closet and introducing stinging insects to that child as a form of punishment. So um, they can be used uh, as a tool and have even been used as attempted murder weapons before. Um, in Florida, with our high elder population, on our last bulleted point here, with the abuse of the elderly and children, um, the diabetic bed sores, uh, decubitus ulcers, are commonly infested with um, some particular species of flies that we have here in their maggots. It's, it's quite common. And um, we've been in multiple court cases with a nursing home where we've aged the maggots. The mag maggots have been five days old or seven days old. And the nursing home story was, well, they weren't present when we dressed or attended to the wound uh, last night. So the nursing home may be saying uh, 24 hours or less that the wound may have gone unattended and we can prove that it may be um, a week or more. And um, we have been successful in those cases. Track it. Accident and air crash investigations. Uh, we've been in those as well from the entomological viewpoint. And we're learning that uh, entomophobia, the irrational fear of insects, is one of the leading causes of um, automobile accidents, particularly single occupant, single vehicle crashes. Um, it's also caused some plane crashes before. Uh, in, in 2002, there was an accident study with the Virginia Division of Motor Vehicles where they simply ranked the top 15 driver distractions as documented by state police on the uniform traffic summons. And I point to number 13 where the insect is entering or striking the vehicle as being a cause and a single cause of the accident. Probably no surprise that rubbernecking is number one. If we redid this study today, I'm sure text messaging would be up there somewhere. But I doubt that the uh, insect category would uh, drop much below number 15. Um, lots of people have an irrational fear of insects. So it's a common cause. Uh, to date, 53 plane crashes have been um, attributed solely to insect interference with the pilot or insect interference with some aircraft system, such as clogging up the external pitots or a fuel vent or clogging a fuel line. And these were sole causes of the accident as determined by the FAA. Plants, if you need to document movement of plants or any type of contraband, uh, law enforcement will traditionally harvest the top of the plant for identification. You need to confirm what it is. Um, do not ignore the roots or the soil that they're in. Uh, the insect or mite fauna in the soil can give very valuable information as to where it comes from, particularly if it's being imported in from other countries, um, as real common with cannabis. Um, we can at least give some information as to points of origin. Transportation accidents. We've been involved in some transportation accidents. Uh, this is a locomotive. It has derailed, and it is derailed because it has impacted the locomotive that you see in the background. The crime scene technician who was working this accident was focused on this switch. Um, it's a mechanical switch as a mechanical track. This track wasn't computerized. So it was the duty of the employees for this rail company to attend to this switch at particular times during the day to make sure that it was in the right position for rail traffic. This accident happened quite early in the morning. Um, the switch is supposed to be over here in its primary position and it's supposed to be secured with a padlock. The padlock was missing and the switch was in its alternate position. And ultimately that's what's caused this accident. Um, the crime scene technician knew that their job was to document everything that they possibly could, 
And what attracted their attention here was the spider that had built its web in the gap that was created when these rails slid to their alternate position. So the crime scene investigator knew that if the rails were closed, that spider wouldn't have room to build the web, so the spider would have had to have built its web when the rails slid and they were open. So um, like any good crime scene investigator, it's document, 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 and that's what they did. They took temperatures of the rocks, they took a temperature of the rail bed, they took a temperature of the cross tie, they photographed the spider from as many different angles as they possibly could, and they collected the spider and its web. Um, we have um, a state spider expert who was able to assist law enforcement and use um, nautical and civil twilight tables to determine about the time of day the spider would go to work. And they made some um, estimations as to how long it would take the spider to build that, the web that you see in this picture uh, to that stage of completion. So it gave law enforcement a timeline. And they re-interviewed the six employees of this company who had keys to the lock. Five of them stayed steadfast to their original story. Um, one employee changed their story slightly. And after a few more hours of um, intense um, scientific interview techniques, um, eventually confessed to the crime. So um, you never really know uh, how insects can be useful. So it's important to document most of the insects that you see at a crime scene. What we're going to focus on in this workshop is showing you the insects to focus on. Obviously not all insects are important. Um, generally law enforcement tends to focus on the large ugly insects. So the larger it is, the uglier it is, the more important it may be. But almost the opposite is true. It's, um, some of the very small flies and very small larvae are actually the most important at creating timelines. But it is important to take pictures of any insect activity you see, document where on the body it is, and using proper evidence protocol, put a scale into the photographs. Now, it's difficult for us to judge how large the insect is without a scale, and often the largeness or size of the insect helps us determine how old it is. So what we're going to do in this workshop uh, with discovery and recovery, we're going to focus on the development of the flies. We're going to teach you how to recover and preserve the flies that are present on the body. And the flies are usually the first insects to arrive. They deposit eggs or larvae on the body, which develop at a known rate. And that's how we end up answering all the questions that you have. And there's really nothing that's unique about the flies that we find on human remains. They get on most large vertebrate carcasses, and they're the same familiar green and blue and black flies that you would see around your trash can in the summertime. Uh, we can just make use of their life stages, their biology, and their development to give you information. It's important for you to be able to recognize all of the stages in a fly life cycle. Most all of the flies that we have go through the same life cycle. Some will skip the egg stage and go straight to a larva, but by far most have the stages that you see here. Where you have an adult, uh, which should be easily recognizable as an adult fly to you. And it's important to note the size of the adults and colors of the adults. These adults then deposit eggs. The white are the eggs, and there's one maggot in each egg. So it will incubate, um, just like a chicken egg or a bird egg, for a period of time. One larva hatches out of each egg. That larva can immediately begin to feed on the body. Um, they cannot penetrate unbroken human skin, so they have to be at a site of trauma or at a natural body opening. Um, and if they are at the proper site, they will feed, um, they will molt three times. So much like a snake shedding its skin to grow larger, the maggots will do the same thing. And they will end up in a third instar, or third stage maggot. And then that maggot will eventually be the stage that leaves the body and distributes itself elsewhere in the environment. If it's inside, it will get under baseboards, it gets under rugs, it will get under furniture. Um, they don't like light, so they seek places that are dark, which means that you often won't be able to see them. So you'll have to move things in an indoor location to be able to find them. In an outdoor environment, they will tend to dig into the soil or burrow. So you will have to um, remove some leaf litter, dig into the soil a little bit, and attempt to find um, these pupil cases. The adult fly will then pop one end of the case off. The adult fly literally walks out and then goes elsewhere to continue its life cycle. And it repeats all over again at the next set of remains. Rarely do they ever recolonize the same set of remains um, as we've said before. 
It's important for you to be able to determine the difference between male and female flies. Male flies simply arrive at the body because the female flies are present, um, but it's the female flies that key in on the chemicals that are given off by the body. It is uh, the, female the female fly is the one that's going to deposit the eggs, starts the uh, biological clock that we use. So the females are distinguished by having this gap between uh, their eyes on top of the head. And this is something that you can see with the naked eye. So after you do your aerial collections of the body and you've placed these adults into a, a solution of 80% ethanol, take just a moment to look at the top of the head and make sure you can see this space. Then you have some females. If the eyes appear to touch on top of the head, then those are males. And you should keep doing your aerial eight technique over the body with the um, net until you collect a nice representative number of females. So the females are what we can confirm the identification of the larva, and the females are what we can anchor our timeline on for the postmortem interval estimations. So flies will arrive at human bodies in a fairly predictable sequence. Trauma will alter that sequence. Um, and you may also have beetles, flies, and larvae present all at the same time. Um, so you don't really see the distinct stages that are talked about in textbooks. It's more of a continuum. And ultimately, we as entomologists can look at photos like this and tell um, what these insects are doing and why they're there. But you as law enforcement um, aren't really going to be able to make those distinctions. So the key would be to collect just as many different looking organisms as possible from the body. Now, you don't need them all. Uh, we need more than one. So. Uh, the idea to keep in mind is just a nice representative sample. So generally what happens is a group of female flies will arrive on the body. They have the ability to um, see much like we do. They see multiple images and the color is off, but they can see objects. Um, they see movement. They can see sites of trauma. They can see the natural body openings and they have the ability to judge the size of the carcass which is why you have different species that may be on a rat or mouse, which would be different from, say, a deer or a human. So they do have the ability to judge size. Often what happens is you will have an aggregation of female flies, and that's where the first colonization of eggs are. Generally, when one female fly starts to deposit eggs, she gives off chemicals which attract other females to that same area. So it isn't unusual to see large aggregations of flies. These large aggregations of flies um, result in large clusters of eggs, and we'll see that on the pigs um, that we have out as exemplar specimens during this workshop. So you may see large egg clusters, uh, particularly during the summer here in North Carolina. Um, during the winter, you, you may see very few, and during the fall and um, spring, you may not have large clusters of eggs. You may have the body with a very light dusting of eggs. So you're not always going to have the large egg clusters, but certainly during the summer months, you will see them. One of the first areas that flies will arrive to would be the hair. Female flies like the texture of hair. Uh, they crawl through the hair. It provides a little bit of shelter for their eggs, and they will cement their eggs to the hair. It's more common in male and female victims that happen to have long hair. So the longer the hair, the more likely it is the initial stage of colonization is going to be in the hair. And often it's not near the scalp. Uh, it's often towards the end of the hair. And you may not be able to manipulate the body enough to look through the hair, so it's a good idea to accompany the body to the medical examiner's office or coroner's office and have them comb through the hair and gently recover the eggs that are present in the hair. So the take-home message is that some of the initial stages of colonization are actually in the hair. With animals, um, because of the thick hair coat for animals, um, the body uh, may be completely covered with fly eggs. So that entire hair coat may just become matted with eggs. So remember that if you're working animal abuse or animal cruelty cases. Folds of skin are another common place for very early colonization. Flies like places that are dark. They also like places that are moist. So elbows, backs of knees, folds in the neck. Um, need to manipulate those areas and check in the folds of skin. Any egg batches that are there um, should be recovered. May not be true colonization because unless there's trauma present, they're not going to be able to penetrate that skin and feed in the underlying tissues. But if they're still present and they are alive, they should be collected because at least we can give you um, some basic time intervals on that.
So large clusters of females results in large clusters of eggs. If there's trauma present, they will often go to the trauma first. Trauma produces an avenue of access to the body. Uh, trauma produces blood. Blood is liquid. Blood also has a lot of sugars in it and it's a source of protein. So it's a food source for the adult flies. It's an avenue of access into the body for the larva. So they tend to go to trauma first if it is present. Uh, this is a gunshot wound. You can just see some of the blood is just starting to coagulate. And this is about a half hour post-mortem. So you see in many cases it does not take long for the adult flies to arrive. This is a good uh, photo to help you distinguish between males and females. These are two male flies. You can see very large um, eyes. Most of the surface area of the head is taken up with eyes and they visibly touch on top of the head. And here you have two females where you see a small eye, a great deal of face, facial area, and a distinct gap on top of the head. So it's easy to tell male and females. And we're interested in you collecting the females and not necessarily the males because the females are what help us with our biological clock. In the absence of trauma uh, in humans, the flies will go to the eyes first, then the nose, the mouth, and eventually the ears. So that's in the absence of trauma. They will go to the eyes first because the eyes are, are moist in life. They liquefy very quickly after death. And it doesn't matter whether the eyelids are closed or open. These flies will deposit um, eggs. Uh, they have the ability to manipulate the eyelids, so they can deposit eggs under the eyelids. So it's very important to, when you're at a scene, uh, look very closely in the eyes. Uh, take your fingers, open the eyelids, use a light source, shine under the eyelids very well, check in the corners of the eyes. That's where the first colonization is going to be. If it's not in the hair and you don't have a site of trauma. They may then make use of the nose. Um, the breakdown of the mucous membranes gives off methylmercaptan, and that is um, strong attractant to adult flies. So um, the nose and mouth may be areas that they will colonize just because of the close proximity to the mucous membranes. So you should use a light source, look up into the nasal cavity, um, look in the mouth, and make collections. And as I've said, they're eventually going to make use of the ear canal and what they're trying to do is gain access to the cranial vault. And these insects will generally skeletalize human and animal remains from the head down. So you have a large cluster of, uh, um, of adult flies that will get um, near the natural orify of the head in the absence of trauma. That results in large clusters of eggs. Those eggs hatch, results in large clusters of maggots. They stay together as they develop on the body and they generally go from head to toe. So you should see a head down um, progression of decomposition and skeletalization on the body. That should be very obvious to you. And the other thing that should become obvious is the insects aren't really patchy in distribution. They just don't appear at random. Um, here's the insect colonization. They're starting to move down the head and into the neck have some activity on the shoulders as they're working their way down, but the torso, abdomen, chest, pelvic area of this individual is completely devoid of insect activity, and that's what you would expect to see. So you should always keep in mind that head down progression, and anything that changes that head down progression, if it happens to be most of the insect activities in the groin or pelvic area or in the extremities, that should indicate to you that there's some sort of um, trauma or soft tissue pathology present. And it's your job as an investigator to try to find out um, what caused that trauma that triggered the, the differing behavior of the insects.